Welcome to Old World Theology with Brian Newberry. This is the first episode, hopefully of many. And this episode is going to have two parts. The first part is introduction. What is Old World Order Theology? And what is the difference between Old World Order Theology and New World Order Theology, so to speak? Second part of the video, I'll just give a brief background of myself, uh, uh, just to kind of give you context of who I am and what uh, this channel is going to be about. The channel will have a variety of topics ranging from the very simple to the very complex, hopefully. Uh, so this episode, we will talk about what is Old World Order Theology. So basically, it's the theological and epistemological framework of doing Christian theology before all of the new philosophies uh, began to enter in the early 15th and century and uh, the 16th century. So in other words, uh, uh, classical Catholicism, not to be confused with the Catholicism you might be familiar with, which has been on display for the last 50 or 60 years necessarily. So is there even a such thing as a new world order versus old world order? Well, yes, there is, uh, and it's uh, very well documented in various places, various books, various documents, including right here on the $1 bill on the back, right? Many of you have seen this before, have read it. Let's try to get this in focus here. See the pyramid, it has the Latin phrase, annuit coeptis novus ordo seclorum, which means approval of the commencement of the new order of the ages. And then you have to ask, under God or under man, uh, what does that mean exactly, right? And you also might note that those are uh, symbols used uh, frequently by the Freemasons. So when did the New World Order begin, or when did their ideas kind of uh, come about? You know, the ideas actually uh, go back, uh, you know, quite some time. You could even say during the Renaissance of the uh, late 14th century, kind of the rediscovery of Greek culture and literature and humanism, you know. And uh, not to say that those things are bad in and of themselves. Humanism, if it's properly ordered and uh, subjected to God, uh, subordinated rather, uh, can be a good thing. We have uh, good literature, we have good education, the humanities, and so forth, and those are not bad in and of themselves. But the problem is that it could lead to a slippery slope where you have a humanism which is man-centered, where everything is subordinated under man and the rights of man, where God is either you know, unimportant or indifferent to what men do. So it becomes man-centered rather than God-centered. So man becomes the arbiter of truth and good and evil, right? And then the authority structure, which had been in place for well over a thousand years in Europe, uh, in the uh, Roman Catholic Church, uh, you know, it began to, you know, to be questioned uh, during this time in the minds of many, especially at the universities. Now, I'm going to give a very simplistic uh, and generalized uh, summary of some of the historical movements starting with the Enlightenment period uh, that kind of explain the process of how the New World Order, the Novus Ordo Seclorum, came to be. Now, like I said, this is highly generalized. I'm broad brushing on purpose because these are very uh, detailed and complex situations, and I, and I grant that. You know, a lot of things kind of led up to these uh, events in these social movements, uh, such as the Black Plagues, uh, the Great Western Schism, where there were three popes who claimed to be pope at the same time, and, and, uh, and general corruption. You know, that kind of led uh, men to be skeptical of uh, the hierarchy and the authority structure of the Roman Catholic Church. So, of course, uh, we've all heard of the Protestant Reformation, or depending on your perspective, the revolution, the revolt, in 1517 with uh, the German monk Martin Luther. Uh, he questioned, uh, brought into question the legitimacy of the papacy and the authority of the Roman Catholic Church uh, as far as what dogmas were, what truth is, and what truth was not, according to their authority, which they had always claimed that 
was God-given and instituted by Jesus Christ himself. Now, uh, among other things, uh, Martin Luther claimed that each individual Christian, uh, by virtue of being members of the common priesthood, had the right to read scripture for themselves and to interpret it for themselves. And this led to the idea that uh, because the papacy, in his view, that was not explicitly taught in the Bible, therefore it should be questioned as if it's legitimate or not. And and then the you know big uh, and it was actually in my opinion uh, the Protestant Revolution was more political than theological. Although uh, Martin Luther certainly had theological arguments which he wanted to really take up in debate, and he because he really did want to remain Catholic and have the debate within uh, the walls of the Catholic Church, but uh, they were not willing to uh, hear him out on those things, and. and and then there you have it. And so th therefore Martin Luther kind of removed himself under the authority of the Catholic Church and under the bishop and the pope and placed himself under the authority of the German nobility instead. And then not too long after that, in England, you also have the English Protestant Reformation under King Henry VIII because he wanted to obtain an annulment for his marriage uh, because... Uh, the queen was not able to give him an heir, and he also fancied a young woman, and he wanted to marry her instead. Uh, so he sought an annulment through the Catholic Church. Uh, they denied him, so therefore he declared himself as head of the Church of England and broke off from uh, the Pope in Rome. And then you have that uh, Protestant revolt in England. So you have two very powerful regions in Europe the, the Germanic countries and England uh, revolting against uh, the Pope of Rome and the Roman Catholic Church and establishing their own authority. So you have a series of wars, very violent, of Protestants versus Catholics, uh, certain Protestants against other Protestants teaming up with Catholics against their enemies. And it was very disheartening for many of the citizens of Europe. Uh, so a lot of people began to become skeptical of religion in general and became more secularized. And then you have what you call the Enlightenment period, which had a series of philosophies which were competing uh, with the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, and in the Enlightenment, you have this idea that reason, and not God, and not scriptures, not the Pope, and not the Catholic Church, that human reason is the ultimate authority uh, of the human being. So where Martin Luther said that the Bible alone is the final authority of the Christian, now you have people who might even be doubting the existence of God. Uh, atheists, atheists started to emerge, and agnostics, uh, and then deism kind of emerged. Deism is the belief that God created everything and then kind of let it go using uh, the laws of nature to determine everything. So that combined with reason, uh, that was able to determine what ultimately is true and, and authoritative for the person. So the idea was that the laws of nature using the scientific method, uh, that would be able to determine what is true and what is false and that everybody should be able to reasonably agree on these things. Well, it turned out the, that wasn't quite the case, so you had a plethora of competing philosophies going against each other during the 17th century. And none of this would have been possible if it were not for the revolt of Martin Luther and King Henry VIII. Uh, after all, the philosophers and these schools have to be funded, right? So then, so you have basically have a, a bunch of uh, competitors of authority and truth, which is very important. And then in the year 1717, you have the first established lodge of Freemasonry in England. Now, Freemasonry is, you know, it was a secret society. They met in secret and discussed things which might, in, in religious terms, be considered uh, anathema, uh, forbidden. And they discussed various uh, matters. Now, to be a Freemason, uh, you did not 
have to be uh, an adherent to a particular religion, the minimum requirement is that you had to believe in a god of some sort. It didn't really matter which god. It could be the Allah of the Quran. It could be the, the Lord of the Bible, Jesus Christ, uh, uh, one of the Hindu gods. It, it didn't matter. As long as you believe that some kind of deity exists, you could be a Freemason. So ultimately, uh, th this leads to religious indifferentism, meaning that all religions basically teach the same things, that the morality of all the world religions are basically the same. So ultimately, you know, the plan is kind of to make this uh, global one world religion where we're not fighting and going to war over particulars and dogmas, where we can kind of just uh, reduce everything to general truths and general morality shared by all the world religions. and you know, hold hands and sing Kumbaya. And then later that led to, uh, in 1776, a man named Adam Weisopt in Bavaria created uh, the Order of the Illuminati in Bavaria. Uh, now these, uh, the Illuminati, these men uh, first and initially, uh, they were, were part of the, the Freemasonic Lodge. And then they kind of had some disagreements, and they kind of, uh, Adam Weishaupt uh, kind of broke off and started his own order. And both the Freemasons and the Illuminati uh, of Bavaria, they both had a common enemy, namely the Roman Catholic Church. So that they agreed on, a lot of other things they disagreed on. And a lot of the members of the Illuminati were uh, atheists, so that was one of the differences of uh, the Illuminati in 1776 and the Freemasons. And co coincidentally, or perhaps not, uh, that was also the year of the Declaration of Independence, uh, the United States of America. So kind of uh, all these things are happening, you know, at once and all kind of under these uh, Enlightenment uh, philosophical ideas, which uh, were competing with uh, the hierarchy of the Catholic Church. So rather than have a hierarchy of authority, authority coming from the top down, all of a sudden you kind of have what you call eminence where the truth is kind of within man and it's up to man to use his reason along with the uh, laws of physics and the laws of nature, you know, with the God of nature, uh, kind of to lead us into truth, you know, from, so the authority comes from below and from the people rather than from above, from God and the Pope and the bishops. So those are the, you know, two kind of competing ideas in all of these things. And then you have the French Revolution of 1789, which is a very violent revolution. And they had two uh, enemies in their crosshairs. Of course, the Roman Catholic Church, uh, because the French wanted to be secularized. And also the second enemy of the French revolutionists was the monarchy, which had uh, a lot of problems at, at the time and corruption as well. And, and there are a lot of other uh, you know, uh, events and, and things that also contributed to this. So in 1789, they were actually, you know, they broke out the guillotines and they were beheading priests and nuns in the streets of France. And it, was, it was very violent. And then short after came Napoleon Bonaparte. He kidnaps the Pope. He conquers a bunch of nations and territories, uh, starting, you know, wants to be the emperor uh, of the entire uh, European continent and was nearly successful at it. So you have all these competed ideas. Uh, and then eventually this... Uh, these kind of ideas came to what we know in religious terms called modernism, whom Pope St. Pius X calls the, or which Pope St. Pius X calls the synthesis of all heresies. Now, modernism, uh, it's very complicated. Uh, a very simple way to explain it is perhaps the Christianization of liberalism, or you could say the evolution of truth, right? that uh, reality is in a constant state of flu, and uh, so the truth evolves. There's no such thing as uh, a fixed dogma. So it kind of it challenges the idea that God is immutable and eternal and unchangeable. That uh, So it really is pantheistic in nature. So God is kind of, uh, he, his existence is contingent on uh, time and space, and he cultures and social movements so that God kind of has to evolve with his creation, which is uh, paganism, pantheism. So these are the kind of ideas that uh, modernists uh, teach, right? And uh, 
Pope St. Pius X, he, I believe he refers to the unholy trinity of modernism, meaning the three primary philosophies through which it is taught. So the first one would be naturalism, meaning that uh, everything needs to be viewed uh, in natural terms only uh, rather than supernatural terms. So, for example, all of the miracles of the Bible are explained away. They're not really miracles that uh, people just thought they were because they had no better explanation. But in reality, using the scientific method and human reason, they can be uh, explained away uh, through natural processes. Uh, so God really isn't involved with creation. Again, it's deism. Uh, the second one would be rationalism. You know, not that you know using uh, rational means of logic is bad, but rationalism you know, is basically the thought that uh, human reason is the ultimate authority uh, and arbiter of truth. And then the third one would be liberalism. Now, when I say liberalism, I'm using it in its philosophical sense, not necessarily uh, Republicans versus Democrats or anything like that. Liberalism meaning to, you know to be free. So you have to ask if you. Uh, if you are a philosophical liberal, uh, if you identify as one, what are you exactly trying to be free from? Uh, so in this case, uh, philosophically speaking, you want to be free from an authority outside of yourself, such as the Pope, uh, Scripture, uh, God. So ultimately, liberalism is uh, Luciferian in nature uh, in that I am my own arbiter of truth through my reason and through my intuition, my eminence, I can determine what is right and wrong for myself, which is really uh, it's a play straight from Genesis chapter 3 uh, when uh, the serpent tempts Eve, saying, if you eat this fruit, your eyes will be opened and you will know good and evil for yourself and you'll be like God. That's ultimately what liberalism philosophically is. Uh, so uh, the next century, in the 19th century, then you have Charles Darwin and his theory of evolution, which is basically an explanation uh, an alternative explanation uh, for the creation account in Genesis, and which is, had always been taught uh, by the Christians uh, from the Holy Bible since uh, 33 AD and before then with, uh, with the Jews. So I often refer to Dar Darwinism as uh, mythology for agnostics because they reject supernatural intervention by God in creation, so therefore they have to explain it in another way. So mythology is explaining how things came to be using uh, contemporary jargon. So Darwinism is basically that using scientific jargon. So it makes it sound scientific or in reality it's just philosophical speculation because true science is not science unless you can observe it and test it in its natural environment. And concerning macroevolution specifically, and Darwinism in generally, you, you cannot uh, test it in its natural environment. You cannot observe it. So therefore, it is uh, more like mythology and less like science. I know that's very controversial, but uh, maybe I'll have another episode on that uh, later. So then the next revolution uh, begins in 1917 in Russia with uh, the communist revolt. Uh, uh, now, by this time, since all, uh, you know, everything pertaining to uh, old world order theology and Catholicism has been rejected, and now everything is man-centered in a disordered humanism, so now ultimately the state or the collectivism of human ideas becomes God, becomes mother and father, and not uh, God, not the hierarchy of God, Christ, father, mother, and children. So what happens in 1917 is a violent overthrow of the Russian czars, and then the uh, you know promoting the state as God ultimately, the arbiter of truth and the ultimate authority. So what happens in the next decade, the 1920s, you have a sexual revolution, including the the promotion of homosexuality and sodomy, pride parades, and everything that happened in the 1920s in Russia because in order for the state to be God, father and mother, you have to get rid of the natural hierarchy that God created with God, Christ, father, mother, children. So in order to do that, you have a sexual revolution where sex becomes less about procreation and less about intimacy between spouses and more about pleasure. So it's an inversion. 
you know, sex, sexuality uh, properly ordered uh, is primarily about procreation and then secondarily about intimacy between spouses. And then the pleasure aspect is a means to those ends. So in order to invert that, you, you know, or in order to cre destroy the natural hierarchy created by God, you have to invert those principles. So sex becomes about pleasure between consenting adults or even worse in some cases. And that's what happened uh, as a result of Marxism. Now it's interesting in the 1960s hippie countercultural movement in the United States of America, something almost exactly the same happens. Now it's no secret that uh, the Soviets and the communists were trying to infiltrate the American government since the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. You know, you have the Red Scare, you have McCarthyism, uh, and, and all of that. So by the time you ha hit the 1960s, they also have a sexual revolution, drugs, uh, homosexuality is uh, promoted, pride parades, and everything. So it's just a repeat. That's Marxism. So all of these ideas are part of the Novus Ordo Seclorum. Uh, they are a natural consequence of these ideas beginning in the disordered humanism of uh, which came out of the Renaissance, even though it was not intended to happen. That's what happened. So once the authority structure, which is instituted by Jesus Christ through St. Peter and his successors and the bishops and the Holy Catholic Church, once that is disrupted, everything is a slippery slope. And that explains how we get to where we are today with the New World Order. So on this channel, I am promoting Old World Order Theology, and which is diametrically opposed to New World Order Theology. Now, for the second part of the video, just a brief background about myself. I used to be an evangelical Protestant for 20 years. I even graduated from a Protestant seminary. Halfway through seminary, I realized that I was Catholic. Uh, so what led me to these uh, conclusions? Uh, well, part of it was reading the early church fathers, uh, you know, my idea that, you know, the Bible kind of ends at the end of the first century, so what happened after that? It can't just be immediate apostasy until Martin Luther in 1517, uh, that God wouldn't let the human race uh, alone for, you know, 1500 years. That just seems preposterous, especially you know, with the promises of Jesus Christ. On this rock I will establish my church and the gates of hell will never prevail against it. So that means uh, that the church that Christ instituted would always be around even if corruption did occur at certain levels. Uh, human free will, right? That's That comes with the territory. And also Christ promised uh, you know, in his farewell discourse in the Gospel of John, chapters 14 through 17, he promised the apostles that the Holy Ghost would come and guide them into all truth. Now, all truth literally means 100% truth without error. It's a doctrinal statement. So that means the gates of hell will never prevail against the church, and the church would be guided by the Holy Ghost, who would guide them into all truth, which means when they decided doctrinally on a matter, uh, that the Holy Ghost is guaranteed to prevent them from making a mistake. And we see that as early as the Jerusalem Conference in Acts chapter 15. Now, before that was ever written down, that was a reality. And it was 100% true even before it was written down in a book, which we call the Bible, and Acts of the Apostles specifically. So, therefore, the, the oral transmission of this uh, had, had always uh, been in force, uh, even before it was written. So that's one thing. So the unity of doctrine it was very important uh, because Christ promised it. He, the idea that every individual Christian carries around a Bible and gets to decide for themselves what the Bible is teaching, the interpretation, the application, uh, that just leads to division and schism and thousands of denominations which never agree on the one book that they all agree on, which is, just seems... A contradiction in terms. Uh, so this idea of unity which Christ emphasized so much in the farewell discourse, uh, it seemed to be the opposite of what uh, the, the results of the Protestant Reformation, it, you know, how it happened in, in time and space. 
And also at seminary, you know, studying all these PhD biblical scholars and theological scholars, they couldn't agree on hardly anything to save them lives. Now, certain interpretations uh, were very good, even though they might not have agreed 100%, meaning uh, logically coherent, right? You could be logically coherent in a systematic theological system and still be wrong if your premises are wrong, even though it's logical. And then other interpretations were were plausible but not likely based on the situations. And then some of the interpretations by PhD scholars were just, uh, you could tell they're totally subjective and they're doing isogesis instead of exegesis. They're putting into it what they want to be true, subjectivism, uh, relativism, which all this leads to. I mean, the New World Order leads to uh, relativism. And, and that's exactly you know, what I experienced in, in seminary and in Protestantism in general, you know, that, you know, nobody can really agree on a whole lot other than uh, Jesus Christ as Lord. Basically, the only things that virtually all Protestants agree on are things uh, taught by the Catholic Church. So there. So, you know, that kind of led me to believe, okay, so which churches uh, can trace their lineage back all the way to the Apostles? and to the early church fathers. Uh, so really it came down to the Eastern Orthodox churches, plural, uh, or the Roman Catholic church, singular. Now, being uh, a monarchical government uh, under the Pope, this, you know, practically speaking, uh, leads to unity. So no matter how bad any given situation in the Catholic church gets, it can potentially be solved because they have a supreme pontiff who could make a decision unilaterally of how to fix it. That is not possible in Eastern Orthodoxy because the patriarch is local and regionalized and he might not necessarily be in communion with another patriarch. Uh, so, And they can't even authoritatively call a council uh, to fix any problems. So it, they're in a kind of perpetual state of localized uh, tribalism, which isn't inherently bad, but it certainly cannot fulfill the unity promised by Christ. Uh, so those are kind of uh, some of the you know, basic reasons that kind of led me into Catholicism and also studying uh, the Bible in historical context and theology in historical context. So, you know, being a 21st century American, I can't read... Uh, an ancient library of books, which is what the Bible is, and read it through my 21st century eyes and understand it. I have to understand it how was it, it was originally intended in that uh, culture and context. Trying to understand it in my own culture and context, uh, I'm going to come to all kinds of uh, false conclusions, uh, necessarily so. Uh, so that's, uh, in a nutshell, uh, that that what le that's what led me to being a Catholic. Now, even as a young Catholic, I was still very Protestant in my thinking. I was thinking, well, I could still have my own opinions in various theological uh, areas uh, and kind of secretly, you know, just have my own opinions on it. And, you know, that's just, uh, you know, that just comes out of being a Protestant and being in a seminary, which kind of really puffs up you know, the ego and the pride. Ultimately, I became a very traditional Catholic uh, by studying all the councils uh, and the major uh, papal encyclicals and seeing how everything kind of made sense and everything is kind of unified in these dogmas and doctrines and how important it is to believe in everything. So no more of this idea that, oh, the only thing that really matters is belief in Jesus. Well, Jesus didn't say that because he asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And that's a theological question. And it's interesting that one of the very first things that the church tackled was Christology. Who is Jesus Christ? Is he fully God and truly man? Is he half God and half man? Does he have one mind or two minds, one will or two wills, and those kind of things? So they had to decide uh, on all these things. Even before the Bible was formed, they were deciding Christology, right, the Trinity, and, and those kind of things. So, so that's it, pretty much. I hope to see you on the next episode. God bless.